So I haven't really. Oh no, you're supposed to start it at uh, three o'clock. Okay, let's just pause, pause the resist, uh, registration first of all. Oh. Perfect. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session, the joy of finance and the rise of machines. Uh, we got our presenters with us, Alison and Sylvia. And during the presentation, feel free to use the chat uh, uh, option where you can ask questions. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we are going to answer all your questions. And I'm going to pass it over to our presenters. Okay, good afternoon. So my name's Alison Broughton. And I'm the program leader for the business accounting um, degree program that we run at Middlesex University. So welcome. And um, I also teach on our other accounting program, which is our accounting and finance program. Um, I am a chartered management accountant, which means I trained with SEMA, the professional body, and I did my exams whilst working in industry. And then later, after several years working in industry as an accountant, I then started teaching in higher education. And we also have my colleague here, Sylvia. If Sylvia would like to introduce herself. Yep. Uh, I'm Dr. Sylvia Gottschalk. Uh, I'm an economist. I also have a degree in physics. And it's very useful in finance because uh, finance is a very quantitative subject. And um, I'm the program leader of the BSc Banking and Finance, uh, which I'm going to introduce to you um, after Alison's presentation. Um, before coming to Middlesex, I worked as a forecaster. So I have some uh, experience in applying what I teach in real life. And uh, this is very useful because I can um, bring it to the classroom. Uh, all my industry experience, I'll bring it to the classroom and um, we, we have done amazing things that I'm going to talk about uh, later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. Okay, so I will now share my screen and hopefully this, you'll be able to see the presentation. Okay, so can you all now see, sorry, um, a pineapple? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Yes, we can see a pineapple. That's good. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking to you today about is um, the joy of accounting. And I thought I'd start with a picture of a pineapple. So that um, to help you to remember our presentation today. Most people, when you get sit in the classroom, the uh, research seems to suggest that most people will forget most of what they've been told within a few hours after the presentation. And within a month, 90% of people will have forgotten what they were told during that presentation. So if you don't remember that much about Middlesex University, maybe you'll remember that we showed you a pineapple. <laughs> and that you're very welcome to enjoy your pineapple presentation. <laughs> So moving on, I've got a photo in here next and hopefully you can see here a photo of several different images. Are all the images the same on this photograph, do you think? No. Can anyone, you can write into the tap, into the chat if you like, can anyone see some different things? Uh, what can you see, anything? Are they all the same? Does everyone think that it's the photo is the same? These are photos, all, every photo here is a photo of a muffin, perhaps. Or do we think that there's something else there? Can anyone spot anything else that's a photo of? Or are they all the same? No. Uh -uh. You have muffins. Some individuals are different. Okay, what else can you see? You see a muffin? Is there anything else that you can see a photo of? Or is it hard to tell a difference? <laughs> are there one, one, two, three, four, five, six, six? Oh yeah, cupcakes. Anything else? For 
Some are dogs. Okay, so you can spot the difference. Okay, but we have quite a few images there. And you have to sort of sort through, look at them and decide which one. So if you were thinking, oh, I'm quite hungry, quite fancy eating a cupcake, you'd have to sort through and find which one of those is a cupcake and not a dog, okay? So that you pick up the right one to eat and hopefully you're going to pick up the right one to eat. And that's something that's important as a concept within accounting, because within accounting, what we're doing is we're trying to communicate useful information to the people who need that information to make their decisions. And so the information needs to be relevant to that decision. So if your decision is, you know, what shall I, I decide to eat? You would obviously want to know about the cupcakes. And if maybe if you're purchasing, you want to know about your, your selling cakes, you would want to know about the cupcakes maybe, and what's those. You would not want to know about the pictures of the acute dogs. So that's an important concept that we have, is picking out and sorting through and finding relevant information for what we're going to, to, to use. So we're gonna come back to this picture at the end, but we're now going to go through a few um, ideas about accounting. So I'm gonna to talk to you at first about um, accounting and the joy of accounting. And then we're gonna have Sylvia who will follow me with a, um, interesting discussion on the rise of the machine, and then you can have some questions and answers. So, but throughout all of the discussion, you can ask questions within the chat and we'll try to answer them. So, we have about an hour here today. So, you're at the start of an exciting journey. You're about to start to learn about finance, accounting, maybe banking and finance. And this, at the start of this journey, it can be difficult to know where to start. How do you begin? What's the most important things to know about? Maybe some definitions about what accounting is about, and about uh, what we call elements that you may have within your financial reports that you're going to produce. Or shall we just start with more of the philosophy? Where did accounting come from? Okay. What is the sources of accounting and why did we develop it? So that is what I'm going to start with with you today. So here I've got some, a photo here. So what do people think they can see here? Anyone know what those? Again, they're all different, aren't they? Okay. These are actually what we think may be the start of accounting and counting, okay? So these tokens all represented a number. And if you think about it, communicating, how do we normally communicate? What sorts of things do we use? I've used some of these words already. We might write things down. We might have what we call literacy, reading and writing, to record and to then deliver our messages and people could read what you've written many years after you've written it, it's been recorded. We have numbers, we can count, and we have a way of organizing our numbers so that we've got symbols for each number. But there has been research, like this was back to 1990s, where we have a research called Schmant Basaret, if I say that right, who did some research into account to um, before writing, and before writing, she, the researcher decided that these tokens represented numbers. So before we wrote and had symbols for numbers or wrote words, we may have used these tokens to represent a number. So in exchange for, um, in, in order to um, do our transactions. So accounting, they, from that research, the implications are that we've had accounting around with us for the last 10,000 years. And it's maybe predates having writing, literacy and numbers that we would know today. We can then move forward a few thousand years and we can come forward to um, sort of the 15th century. So we're only 500 years ago now. And we have an Italian mathematician, Luca Pacioli. And Luca Pacioli, 
um, set down a way of recording transactions. And we're going to talk more about transactions and what I mean by that. But recording the transactions, um, you had an equal and an opposite. We had this idea of a debit and a credit. Some of you may have heard that terminology before. And that leads us to this concept of double entry bookkeeping, which today is the basis of how we record for our accounting and in our financial systems globally. Everyone uses a very similar way of recording. We have a debit, a credit, double entry. And we're going to discuss that a bit more in a minute. So these tokens are very ancient, but they are the basis of our accounting system today. So I'm back to my pineapple here. So imagine that I'm running a shop, okay, and a fruit shop, and you are walking past and you come into your the fruit shop, okay. What would you, if you were thinking of, of um, maybe having the pineapple to take home, um, what is it that you would be doing? What are you going to um, How, what, what's the transaction here, the business transaction that you would have? All oh, right, you would cut it. That's when you've taken the, that pineapple home. <laughs> okay, what transaction would you have to do before you could take the pineapple home? Buy it, okay. The business transaction, what would the business transaction be? You're the customer and you're going to buy the pineapple so you can take it home and cut it and then hopefully eat your pineapple. What's the business transaction? What me, the shop seller here, what am I going to do? <laughs> if you're buying the pineapple, all right, yes, I would have had to have bought the pineapple from a supplier. But then to give to pineapple to you, what's the transaction there? If you are buying the pineapple, I must be selling. Yes, exactly. Okay, so. In a business transaction here, if we were to record this, we would record a purchase from the customer equals a sale from the shop. We have an equal and opposite here. Someone has bought the pineapple, therefore the shop has sold the pineapple. Okay, so an equal and opposite. And that's where we have this idea of the debit and the credits. Yes, so I sell to you the pineapple and I would record that as a sale and you would hand some cash. Okay, yes, thank you. So you're buying the pineapple and you're paying some money. So I would take the money and I would record that as a receipt of money and that would be equal to the amount of the sales that I have recorded to you for the pineapple. So say this pineapple was a pound you would give me one pound, I would put that into the till and I would record a receipt of one pound and a sale of one pound in revenue. Okay, in terms of my, my money coming in, my income. So yes, so the transactions here would be you're purchasing, I've sold and I've recorded as well the income from the sale the money that I've received. So let's move this on to a business. So we've got a slide coming up. So we've got a business here. What can we see there? What sort of business is it? Anyone, what can you see? Anything? What's 
sort of a business is that? Is it a bank? A supermarket, okay. And what sorts of things can you see there? Fruit, yeah. Anything else? We've got some fruit. Any other products that they've got that you can see? No? <laughs> Daily bakes, basis things, yes. We've got some packets on the shelves. Can't quite see what they are, but they're probably juices or um, flour and tins and jars. Food items, in fact, okay. What were those to the business? What are they to the business? What type of, um, what would we call these if you were running the business? Stock, yeah, it's a good word, stock, okay. And what would you, as an overall here, what would you call, we've got stock, we've got fruit and we've got the daily things on the shelves. Can you see anything else that maybe the, yes, another word for stock would be inventory. So inventory and stock are a certain type of thing for the business. What happens when we sell some of that? Okay, they're all things that, um, Sorry, you didn't get the point. Okay, so we've got here fruit and we've got daily basis things and we're calling those stock or inventory. That's right, they are potential revenue. What, how do we get the revenue? It's the same as what we just had the example for, for the pineapple. The shop will sell the items, say the fruit, and then the customer will give them some money and they'll get their, their income. So their sales revenue in the form of maybe cash, or maybe they pay on credit card and then they receive the cash into their bank account later. So that's what we can see there are different types of stock or inventory, potential revenue, okay? What else can you see? Can you see anything else? What's the fruit in, do you think? <laughs> okay, and what's the food stored on? Shelves, yeah. So we've got food stored on shelves. Does the company own those? Does the supermarket own the shelves as well? They own the stock at the moment. And do they also own the shelves? Do they also have these, these shelves? Where, who, are they, they for sale or are they not for sale? the shelves. They're not inventory, are they, the shelves? They're items that they are owned by the company, but they're not for sale, but they're using those items in order to display the things that they're going to sell, okay? What are all of these things to this, this company then? What would we call this? We've got a, like a sort of butterfly here. And all of these are a certain type of element when we are talking about, yes, we're talking about the assets of this company, okay? So assets, okay, can be used in your business, okay, to help to generate revenue. 
There are either the items such as cash, which you can readily, you can sell and you're going to receive in income from, or they're the items so maybe like the shelving, which are used by the company in order to display the goods, to, in order to sell the goods to then generate the income. So they're what we would call assets. What about on the other side? How did they buy these assets? Where would they get the money from in order to buy the assets? Income from working, okay. From the supermarket, do you mean the income from the sales? Yeah, loans. So what do we call that? We'd call that sort of borrowing, wouldn't we? Loans, you could borrow. Who would you borrow from? Bank. And will the bank expect that money back at some point in the future? Yes, yes, and possibly with interest. So at some point, you, you bring in the money from the bank, you borrow the money, that's cash into the company, and you can use that cash to purchase your assets. But at some point, you may have to pay back that money. So does anyone know what we call that in terms of a, a transaction, an element on your financial reports alone? Okay. Liability, yes. Okay, so you might have loans, you might borrow money. What about if the bank says you, you can't borrow that much? Okay, because we don't really know much about you. Where else might you get the money from? Venture capitalists. Okay. Do you know any venture capitalists that would give you money? <laughs> okay. Yes. And what would they give you? Would they give you money and expect that money back? No. What would they expect back then? They're going to give you some money. maybe some of the profits. They would expect to own part of your company and they would share in your profits, okay? So they would become what we call a shareholder, okay? An investor into your company. So we can think of this as the other side of our financial reports in our butterfly here. So we've got our assets on this side. And then as we move through, I go back to my butterfly here. I could say my assets were, say, 50,000 pounds. I could borrow from the bank 30,000 pounds. And I could maybe get from my shareholders an investment of 20,000 pounds. And you can see that 30 plus 20 is going, oops, I've gone too, too far. It's going to equal my 50,000 in my assets. So the money that I've borrowed, my liability from the bank that I've got to pay back, and the money that's been invested from the shareholders into the company, the 20,000 here, okay, are my sources of funds, okay? And we call that 20,000 equity. So on this side, that equals, then I've got my assets. And the assets would be either the inventory, or it could be what we call fixed assets, like the shelving, where we're not going to sell those, but we use those to generate income. Well, it could be money, money that we have, okay, in our, in our um, supermarket cash, okay. 
and there are different forms of assets. Okay, and those assets will equal the sources of funds, our liabilities plus equity. So we have a balance sheet here um, where the assets equal the liabilities plus the equity that's come in. Okay, so sort of um, time moving on. So that concept is the basis of sort of our accounting, if you like, and our financial reporting. So what we've got here is effectively a very basic balance sheet. Okay, with our debits and our credits are equal and opposite transactions, they equal. That's the basis of what we do in accounting. So um, this is just taking this further. This session, when we run this session in the induction week, we spend about four hours on this session. So I'm only giving you a taste to today of, of what we could discuss in this, where we go further into what assets are. And then this idea of equal and opposites. So um, you've got your investor and your lender coming in with the money and the funds. So who needs to know about accounting information? We've got various users of accounting information. Okay, so I've got an employee, they need to know so that they can work out the profits and see and make forecasts and run the company. We need to tax, the government needs to know, and the bank, they need to know about um, how much money that you've borrowed from them and they need to know how you're getting on. Do you pay back? Will you be able to pay back that money? And we have what we've got here, we've got shareholders as well, and they need to know how their company is getting on, so they need that information. So there's lots of users of accounting information, and they use that information to make their decisions. So this um, here is just a pack, which is the colour accounting pack, and you get sent this pack. If you come to Middlesex University, all our students on the accounting and finance um, degrees, they would get the pack and you, you work through that um, in the first term of your degree so that you can work through what are assets, what are liabilities, what's equity and sources of funds and go through those definitions. Um, so that pack is free to all our students. Just quickly, just as time is moving on, I'll just mention that you can do a three-year degree with us or with our degrees, you can take a year out um, in after your second year and you can do a placement year. And we have a number of students who go to say the NHS. We have a, a scheme that we run in conjunction with the NHS. So a number of students do go at the end of their second year. But also you can take placements anywhere. And we have students who take placements in many different sectors of industry. You can also work for the university, uni temps, whilst you're here as well. So um, other an add on into your student life. So at that point, I think I'll pass on to, to Sylvia and uh, we'll have some more time for questions and answers at the end. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Okay, so let me, um, right, so let me share my screen uh, with you guys. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, IT and uh, artificial intelligence in banking, finance and trading. Um, when you think of trading, you probably think of what you're seeing on your screen. Uh, a lot of people screaming, uh, making gestures. And this GIF actually shows the evolution of um, trading between from open outcry to robo advisors. So you see at the beginning, a lot of people on the trading pit um, screaming and making price, actually. That's what they, they're doing, selling and buying and price making. And the first images are in the US. This one is from a film. This is in the, U in the UK, the one where you see the, 
the red um, uh, seats. It's actually the last uh, open outcry uh, pit that exists. It's in the London Metal Exchange. But slowly uh, and slowly, uh, this is disappearing, basically. Uh, and COVID is one of the reasons, but it, it started a long time ago. And nowadays, mostly people trade um, online. And a trading pit looks like what you see on your screen. A lot of computers, a lot of people around computers, but nobody crying, nobody screaming. And there's an advantage to um, computer uh, trading and uh, investment trading. For example, um, you can download an app on your phone. And with this app, you can start investing in stocks, in bonds, in foreign exchange. And uh, you're not limited to stocks in your country. You can invest uh, all over the world. You have an example here on your screen. You see an app. Um, I'm not going to say the name because I'm not advertising anything. But uh, it's uh, one that, if you look at Investopedia, it's one that they uh, survey so you can see what they do. But essentially, a robo-advisor is a substitute of a um, human being, a financial advisor. And it's simply an app. So how do they work? Part of it um, is the same as a financial advisor would do. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met one. It's somebody who comes to your house and talks to you about uh, your finances, um, what you spend, um, your assets, and they uh, propose uh, some investments for you. So the first item here is the same as what a financial advisor, a human being would do. The next one is what the app does. So basically what it does, it's, it offers a what is called a passive um, strategy, which means they are following an index or following a strategy that already exists and that is um, coded in the app. So you start to see there that maybe the app is not as good as a person because a person could give you some other alternative investment that the app cannot. The app can only offer you what is already coded in. But the main advantage of it is that it's very inexpensive and anyone can actually code one and create an app that um, allows people to invest and get money out of uh, these people. Um, further, Moving further from that, because this is already, you know, old technology, uh, the cutting edge now is quantum finance and um, quantum computing. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, but if you think about uh, computers, uh, nowadays your smartphone is much more powerful than any computer that sent um, human beings to the moon. Yes, uh, really, really, it is much more powerful. But it's still not as par sufficiently powerful to solve some very important problems in investment, which is, for example, um, dynam dynamic portfolio optimization. Or when you have to optimize a portfolio, when you have millions of uh, assets in your portfolio, which is the second item, or to create scenarios to try to forecast the future. And one that is amazingly very difficult to um, compute is option pricing, uh, but option pricing when you do it um, intraday and instant by instant. And we have found that for these problems that seemed quite simple and option pricing exists since the 70s, in fact, the modern computer cannot do it uh, instantly and for a large number of assets. So you need uh, more powerful computers and that's where quantum finance enters, but it's still a project. It's still a work in progress because there, there are no quantum computers that can do all these things. So there's still stuff to do. Now, automation is really seen as something negative. Yeah, of course, but it also creates opportunities for people. And um, nowadays, anyone can trade, anyone can invest because all they need is to set up an account with an online broker or download an investment app or create a code that will do the analysis of the data for, for you. You don't need to be on the uh, trading pit. Your computer is going to be there, collect the data and analyze it. So anyone can start investing. And we have an example here, which I like um, despite everything. And uh, I'll come to the everything in a minute. 
it's uh, the story of a teenage boy. Actually, he was in he was not even twenty when uh, Sarib, Savine de Sara um, made twenty six million pounds from his bedroom. Yes, in Honslow, and he was nicknamed the Hound of Honslow, uh, more or less like the Wolf of Wall Street. So that's the Hound of Hanslow because he was super smart and he could code an algo um, trading um, strategy that allowed him to make a lot of money, but also to create what is called a flash crash. Yes, yeah, so it's an instantaneous crash in the financial market uh, that really, really wiped a lot of value of the shares that were being traded in the US. And this happened in, in the US. So obviously he was arrested, he was extradited to the US and he was let go, you know, with a very light sentence to spend one year in home detention. And uh, he paid a fine, yes, um, he doesn't have the 26 million anymore, but he paid a fine of about 12, 12 million and the, the amazing thing about this story is that he was just somebody like you and me, yeah, who could code a strategy on his computer. So that's a positive case study that I really like to um, talk about, even though obviously he's not an example to follow because he was arrested. He, what he did was wrong in the sense it was illegal. And we're not going to tell you to do that, yeah. So on the BSC Banking and Finance, we have um, introduced uh, financial trading um, in two um, courses. One is called the Applied Financial Trading and the other one is Computational Finance. The Applied Financial Trading is a zero credit uh, module uh, that is offered by a partner at the London Trading Institute. So it's somebody from the market. Yes, it's not, he's not, um, an academic in the pure sense. So he's somebody who actually makes his money in the financial market. And he's an algo trader as well. Uh, the reason why he has time to teach at Middlesex University is because he uh, coded a strategy that he checks once or twice a week and the rest of the time he's free to do whatever he wants and he likes to teach. So he teaches the applied financial trading and um, people who take this course will learn how to safely trade because it's very dangerous in a sense, as the example I gave uh, shows. Um, I mean, being arrested is one of the things that can happen to you. You can lose a lot of money as well. And uh, Alberto will teach you how to uh, trade safely and profitably. He has some uh, strategies that are still making money. Um, you get a certificate of completion at the end of the course and the course is free of charge for all Middlesex students. Now, if you enroll in the BSc Banking and Finance, one of the options that are available to you at, in year three is the Applied Computational Finance, where you will learn to code in Python and in R. And this um, course obviously is an option, so you choose if you want to take it, you, you do or, or not. This year, there were about 12 students taking it. and. Uh, the course is offered by uh, Alberto, who takes care of the trading applications of these two um, languages and the R, uh, which uh, I teach as a guest uh, lecturer. At Middlesex, we have a financial markets lab where you can actually trade uh, from um, in, in real life. Uh, about uh, three or four years ago, we had a group of students um, who set up a um, student um, from the student union um, society. Yes, a student society. And they were actively trading in the East um, Asian uh, foreign exchange markets. And because the, the library is open 24 hours a day, they were actually sleeping in the financial markets lab. And in the next morning, the librarian told me that she, she found them sleeping there because they were trading all night from the financial markets app. So you can do that because we have trading platforms. We have Bloomberg that gives you real time uh, information about the market. We also offer um, training to uh, use Bloomberg and data stream and also for certification. We don't offer you training in the financial markets lab to trade. Yes, um, this is what something you do yourself. So the certification 
uh, is offered as a part of uh, workshops that were developed by um, Sarah Hudson, the specialist librarian on uh, databases and Bloomberg and DataStream. Uh, you can attend the workshops all year long, so it's very convenient to, um, you know, to slot in between your studies or your part-time work. If you cannot um, take a workshop during the year, we have intensive workshops after teaching, so when you have more time, and we give you support to pass a certification. But the important thing about that is when you start working with Bloomberg, you can open an account and you can upload your CV, uh, you can contact people in the industry. And uh, we have a case of a student who was on the BA Financial Services who actually found a job because she had this certificate. And we know that because she once contact after she left Middlesex, she contacted us asking for a copy of the certificate, which she had lost because her future employer wanted to see it. So it's really, really useful and it's really valuable. Now, this is the extra, actually. Um, what you're going to do if you uh, enroll in the BSc Bank and Finance is, first of all, accounting. Yes, you absolutely need accounting in your life because if you invest, you're going to, for example, buy stocks on a, of a company and you need to understand the balance sheet of this company. So accounting, there's no way to escape from it. It's really important, but you also need uh, quants, obviously. So we have uh, quantitative methods in year one, year two. Uh, some theory on the financial market and banking and some um, knowledge of risk management and investment management. It's very quantitative, that's true, uh, but we have something um, that complements this. Uh, foreign languages are offered on the program and also um, business startup. So it's a module that you can take in year three to um, help you set up your own business if you want to do that. And there are a couple of other management um, um, modules. So in conclusion, people don't like automation because they think it's going to replace uh, them, replace workers. It might be true, but you still need people who know what they're doing to um, operate the machine. So join Middlesex. Uh, join the BSc Banking and Finance or the BA Accounting and Finance because everything I showed here is also available to the accounting students if accounting is more your thing. But we need the world needs skilled people and machines need people to operate them. Thank you very much. If you have any question, uh, please ask them. Let me stop sharing. Thank you. That was very good. I'm just going to quickly share my PowerPoint for the Q&A. Um, okay. Can you see it? Okay. Just a second, sorry. Okay, Q&A. Perfect. Um, if you have any questions, please do use the chat over here and we will try to answer the questions please don't be shy if you have <laughs> questions <laughs> just ask them okay we still have like um i think roughly 15 minutes before we go so if there are any questions please feel free to ask and thanks a lot for the presentation. I think it was very insightful and gave them like a way to understand like what you study at media sets as well. And um, yes, any questions? Okay, mm, okay. okay before a question. How many students? Right. <laughs> okay, sorry. Let me just read it out. Um, how many students who have graduated from middle sets with an accounting degree have gone uh, on to successful jobs, like where they work and what post, etc.? Okay, I don't think I'll answer this, shall I, Sylvia, because it's accounting. Yeah, it's an accounting one. Yeah. Um, I don't think I know actual numbers, but the majority of our um, graduates will go on to um, secure jobs in maybe finance degrees uh, areas. Some will go on to account into accounting areas as well. 
So some of our students are employed within um, chartered accountants practices. So they'll go on to do audit. Um, we have alumni at KPMG, at PwC, all the big firms, um, as well as um, I know one of our students this year is definitely going off to Grant, Grant Thornton and, and, and others like that. But also some will secure jobs within industry. So we have, you know, we run the NHS placement. Some of our students then go on to stay with the NHS and they get graduate roles within finance at the NHS and they could do ACCA or SEMA through that. Others go on into industry um, and then maybe they do SEMA or ACCA qualifications. Uh, some go into the home office maybe or um, uh, audit for the, the government. So, um, and then they may study SIPFA. And we carry exemptions for all of those big professional bodies. So our degrees carry exemptions for ICAW, the Audit and Assurance, so the Chartered Accountant, ACCA, the Certified Chartered Accountants, SEMA, the Management Accountants, um, and also SIPFA, which is for public bodies, so like the NHS or um, Home Office or um, so forth. And also we have full exemption for AAT as well, bookkeeping. So we are involved as well by alumni. We regularly invite um, graduates who have been successful and graduated and then gone on to um, their careers. And we regularly invite them back um, to, to sort of talk about what they're doing and to sort of help mentor our students and to sort of help them get ready and prepared for um, trying to achieve to, to get those graduate roles. So there's a lot of support there for our students and we have many success stories. Um. So uh, we have a question from Macro. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing no. it correctly. Uh, can Middlesex University provide scholarship for international students? Um, Rudy, do you know the answer to that? Um, to be honest, I think that it's best to go through the website like www mdf.ac.uk. But I saw like today I was just reading about scholarships and I think there's also opportunity for international students, but you need to like, go through like a procedure. I need to read carefully like what they require from you. Yeah. So yeah, the website would be the best place to find the answer. Yeah. Right. So what support is provided by teachers, university to students to ensure they finish their degree satisfied with the grades? Okay. Um, we support you all the way. Yes. Um, we are always available. Um, usually we are in our offices, but this year we were not because you know of COVID and the lockdown. But um, I mean, I can speak safely for all my colleagues and say that we are always there for you. Yes. So no matter if it's uh, office hours or not office hours, if I'm in my office, for example, you knock on the door, I open, I can solve any problem you have. So. We really are um, very focused on ensuring that you make the best. It's not only that you're satisfied with your grades, but we want you to get the best grade possible. We always you know, uh, push you to aim for a first or an upper second. So there's no, no, no issue there. So now, um, the thing is work experience. So uh, as Alison said, we have um, uni temps where uh, jobs are offered for our students. And most of the jobs there are exclusive for Middlesex students. And I know a couple of, I mean, I know a couple of because I, I hired them. I hired two um, BA accounting and finance students to work for me because I had a research grant to do some research, but there are lots of, uh, loads of jobs available there. Um, so also we are very aware that you, most of our students work at the same time they study. So uh, we really, you know, um, support you in try to get the best of your studies uh, while you're working. So I hope this answers your question. Um, how is she diverse? Well, very. Um, that's, yeah. yeah, exactly, very. Yeah, we have people from everywhere. We, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and we support <laughs> that. <laughs> 
Yeah. I also think that uh, the university also uh, support like students with uh, student learning assistance, which means that like during your course, you're going to have like students that did your course like on the previous year and they achieved like a good grade and they're going to be there to assist you like with the lecturers as well. You can ask the questions and they can, like, you can easily relate with them because they're always there like to facilitate like your journey there as well. So I think that the university actually provides you like with a lot of support for your course. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, I think that if we are all good, we could also wrap up. It depends. Okay, well, we look forward to seeing you on, uh, when you've applied to Middlesex, okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. You just have a question that just pop up. So. All right, that's right. Okay, yeah, it is the, it all, it's always been hard to get a, a good job with a good employer and you have to build your CV and we help you with that. We help you with getting experience and with how to write a good CV and with how to write cover letters if you need to do those. We also um, have active involvement with um, outside speakers quite often who will invite in experts in their field to give you advice on assessment centers, which is a common um, sort of screening tool used by employers so that you can um, have the, the tips and advice of how to negotiate your way through those, those, those sort of um, structures of the way they have for the application process. Um, we are actively involved with professional bodies as well, come in and give talks as well, so that giving you advice on careers advice and on application process and so forth. And we also regularly have employers on the campus. This year, of course, that's been online. But um, we would generally have sort of days where in the um, sort of main quad in the air, central area of the university campus, we would have employees there with stands and you could go and talk to them. Within the accounting and finance degrees, we also invite them to uh, give talks to you as well so that you can ask about vacancies that they have and their application process. So we, we spend from day one, really, of you arriving at the Middlesex University, we, we build you to your experiences and your soft skills and your personal development. We help you and guide you so that when you do come to that point, when you've graduated with your T1 first degree, um, you're ready to, to go out into the world and to apply for those jobs and then get those roles that you really want, okay, to get the best outcomes. We give you a lot of support on that. And we have a whole, um, uh, the, the university has um, an employ employability service and they as well, they'll give you lots of, of advice and um, ways to make your applications. So we do give a lot of support on that. Right, so accommodation, uh, yes, the answer is yes, you can always apply um, when you, I mean, if you come to Middlesex um, as your firm choice, yeah, you can apply for accommodation as well. So um, how will teaching be conducted? Teaching will be um, blended, as they say, so the lectures will be online, but all the seminars will be face to face. So you will have like half of your teaching will be on campus and um, face to face uh, with us. So, I mean, yes, that's, that's what we are planning and that's what we'll do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so is the accommodation within the campus, like inside the university? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, because <laughs> we have um, a building just across the road from the university that is um, a student accommodation but no because um, the main I mean most of the accommodations are in Wembley I don't know if you know London um, sufficiently well but it's not really close to the university it's about 20 minutes by bus so it's a, it's a separate um, 
a separate uh, site. And I think it's it's a huge a huge building, and that's where most of the accommodation is. Um, I can also add on that because basically I'm a resident assistant for the uh, accommodation as well. And uh, like as Sylvia actually said, there's a university that is literally, no, no sorry, a, an accommodation that is literally three minutes walk from the uh, university. So it's actually at the front of the university. There's another one that is 20 minutes walk from the university and that's called Platt O. And then we have another one, if you know the areas, is at Creekwood, and that's the like a, kind of a long journey. And we got the ones at Wembley as well. So there's like four, four the accommodation that you can choose from. But on the university website, there's literally like a full detailed descriptions of the accommodation if you wish to choose one of them. Um, so the insurance choice. It's your second choice. If you get the grades for us, then you would have your offer. Yeah. Is it automatic when you get okay? It only it, it wouldn't be yeah. if you get the grades, yes, it would be yeah. on, it would it, come down to, to Middlesex. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and then obviously if maybe you've missed by a grade, then it's best to call. This would be the advice I would give. I don't know, Rudy, if you've got anything else that you want to add there from the, from the university. Um, sorry, what was the question again? Because I was just trying to answer. Um, if you, I mean, it, Middlesex is the, the insurance choice. Okay. So if you not get the grades for the first choice, mm -hmm. then would you need to call Middlesex? Um, it depends. Because uh, I was working also with the uh, UCAS last year. So if you, if you don't get your first choice, Perhaps Middlesex will send you like on the same day, they'll be like, we accepted you as well for your second choice. So it, it's actually on UCAS, but if you don't get like a confirmation letter from Middlesex, that's when you need to start calling uh, in the, and do, doing like clearing and stuff like that. But for your second choice, usually they just say it on the day as well. Yeah, if you don't get into your first, you might get into your second, yeah. Yeah, it's only if you've maybe slipped a grade on our on our offer as well, then you you'd be best advised to call. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Macbur, how much amount? So, are you talking about UCAS points or about um, uh, money? Yeah. Oh, tuition fees. Right. Um, a student okay, finance, fee, isn't it? Yeah, that's what finance. <laughs> Probably yeah. best off looking on the website at the yeah. information on student finance. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it can depend. Definitely. There's another one on accommodation. You might be best here, Rudy. So if you've got it as your insurance choice, Middlesex, um, can you see like the accommodation on the website? You don't have the same um, available to you as those who've got choice, firm choice. If you got it, it's still going to be available because they always take in like uh, applications like for the uh, accommodation. So yeah. Um, yeah. It's always fine, like we would always it's say. It's always fine. available. Yeah. It's always available, definitely. Okay, I think we answered about the money, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. we did. Okay, yeah. Perfect. Okay, I'm just gonna, okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much for your questions. I think right. that um, we really appreciate like the effort and everything and the presentation as well. Wait. Okay. <laughs> oh, thanks again. That's good. <laughs> well, thank we you. hope we see you in thank September. You. <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna say a big thank you. Thank you to everyone that attended today's yeah. session. And thank you to our amazing presenter, Addison and Sylvia as well. I think they did perfectly well. So I was say- really I have to go. Bye bye, guys. Bye -bye. Yeah, bye bye. And see yeah. you in September. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Hope to see you in September. Yeah. <laughs>